Well, so let's go ahead and get started. So this week's webcast is brought to you by Quest Software. Quest has this really cool, totally free Spotlight Cloud. And the thing that I loved about this as a database administrator is very often when I wanted monitoring, I wanted to install the product, but then it also needed some kind of database backend or repository to put my databases in or all my performance history in. And I couldn't just spin up a new SQL server just for the sake of it. And I didn't want to put the database for the monitoring stuff on the same database server that I'm monitoring. That introduces more overhead and makes things worse. So brandozar.com slash go slash spotlight, you can sign up for a totally free Quest Spotlight cloud, monitors up to five SQL servers, and the repository is up in the cloud too. So they just manage all of the data storage for you. You can access your data via a web browser, via iPhone, Android. Gets up, I want to say it's about 150 alerts that they give you. So you get real-time operational alerting without having to dealing with setting up a, uh, a whole repository. Now, this session was one that I gave over at uh, SQL Intersections in Vegas. I'm taking the exact slide deck, but I think it's cool to show you that this is a good example of the kinds of sessions that you can get at conferences like Intersection. I'll be back at SQL Intersection in Orlando in June of this year. We're doing a pre-con. I've already forgotten what my pre Oh, the Developer SQL Server Recipe Book, where I give you a bunch of T-SQL tactics about how you go solve common problems. Partitioning, partition views, pagination, filtered indexes, tricks that you can use in order to get better performance fast. So the session is an introduction to GitHub for DBAs. And you're going to see a lot of links throughout here. All of the links are already up. Oh, no, that's not entirely true. By the end of this video, that's when they're going to go up. I'm going to release both the video and the links at the same time. Brenozar.com slash go slash GitHub for DBAs. The reason that I'm doing this is that I got my first start as a developer back in the really old days. Bill says, are you doing SQL bits this month? Nope, I got to miss that. I'm doing SQL Saturday Israel and SQL Saturday Iceland, which happen to be right around that already. So I'm committed to those. So I got my start as a developer and I, I was used to using old school version control. And then I gradually had to get involved with current version control as a t new modern database administrator. I'll be brutally honest I am not a GitHub expert by any means. I always feel like I'm just like one page further in the manual than I should be. I have no idea what I'm doing. But the reason that I give this session, and here's the abstract for it, is that I struggled with GitHub for years, and I feel like I kind of know what I'm doing now. Still not very confident, but I know that there's a whole lot of you after me, a whole lot of database administrators who are being kind of kicked and dragged into GitHub, kicking and screaming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain to you why distributed version control works the way that it does so that it'll make more sense when we're doing stuff like pushes and merges and pull requests and all kinds of stuff. I'm going to open an issue with one thing that I want to fix in one of the first responder kit tools. I'm going to make the change to the script and I'm going to check it in and push it into the or pull it into the uh, dev branch. Then I'm going to look at what it would take in order to make a contribution to someone else's repo. I am not going to show you all kinds of technical details. We're not going to walk through the installation of the tools. I'm not going to show you continuous integration. I'm not going to go create a GitHub account. I'm going to show you just the bare minimum of what you would need to know in order to get started. And I'm also going to give you all kinds of links to where you can go to learn your next steps because it's going to take weeks to really feel comfortable with doing stuff in GitHub. So to take you back in time, when I was your age, son, we walked up to school, both hill up in the snow, both ways. Uh, we used to have things like Blockbuster. When we wanted to go rent a movie, we would go physically check it out of Blockbuster. We'd be like, hey, do you have the latest copy of Titanic? We would go get it and then check it out ourselves. We would watch it and then we would return it and it would, you know, inevitably have to be rewound. Well, that's kind of how version control used to work too. In the old days, we had things like Visual Source Safe where you would check out a piece of code. You'd go check to see, hey, is SP Blitz available? And no, they would tell you, no, sorry, SP Blitz has been checked out by Rich Benner. You'd have to wait for Rich Benner to check his work back in. And then after he was done, you could go check that out and work on it yourself. This worked really well when you had small teams. 
when the entire team working on a piece of software were all inside the same room, when you could go around and tap someone on the shoulder and say, uh, here, here, I need you to go let go of SP Blitz so I can go work on it. But times changed. Open source happened. And when we talk about open source, that means a lot of people all over the world trying to collaborate on the same piece of software at the same time. And with Linux, Linux is, of course, huge masses, numbers of files and very long files. And you had people trying to work in the same file at the same time. And you needed to track who was working on what and let people merge their code back in together. Linux was a really big, huge driving force behind this. And because of the difficulties using traditional version control, the same guy who designed Linux, who built Linux up off the ground, Linus Torvalds, created Git in order to solve these problems. Now, Git is the predecessor to GitHub. In this session, whenever you hear me refer to GitHub, I'm really referring to anything like it. Git, GitLab, etc. But you're only going to see me using GitHub because that's just the one that I happen to use. In 2008, GitHub was a startup that just wanted to make it much easier for you to use distributed version control for your own projects. And they layered on their own improvements to make things even easier. They were built atop the open source Git, but they just added all kinds of stuff like web consoles and easier tools. Over the course of the next several years, GitHub really won that race. These days, if you look at any kind of open source uh, site, it's all based on GitHub. Everybody checks their code into GitHub. They maintain repositories in GitHub. Microsoft gave up the fight. They used to have their own, it was like SourceForge or it was CodePlex, I think, CodePlex or something like that. But there were other sites that fell by the wayside, like SourceForge and there's another one, Bitbucket, something else. Bitbucket is still a paid software product. That's just fine. And so Microsoft last year decided that they were going to latch on to this because they were already using GitHub for all kinds of things like books online. When you go and read books online, you can actually see that you can go check in your own changes into GitHub. GitHub wasn't ever designed for data. Git, period, wasn't designed for data. It was designed for people who were building operating systems, people who had pieces of code. And then when they changed that code, they could check it in and it would be rebuilt from scratch. That means it works really well for things like stored procedures. It's really easy to use with a stored procedure because every time you go refresh a stored procedure, you're just going to apply the whole thing right over top of it. It's not as elegant for controlling data. For example, if you wanted to put your list of servers in there, that can be a little bit of a struggle because you may want to track what got changed over time and you may want to track inserts, updates, and deletes. It's not really as elegant as what you would want there. Now, because it was built so long ago in order to uh, manage things like Linux development, there's tons of development tools for it. Pretty much every developer tool is miles ahead of the database tools. So you're not going to see me using SQL Server Management Studio in here, Azure Data Studio. You'll see me edit a stored procedure. But it's not like SQL Server Management Studio has elegant integration for GitHub. I'm actually a Mac guy. Almost all my work is done these days on the Mac. But for this, I'm using a virtual machine with Windows because I think that's what most of you are comfortable with. I'm going to be showing the Windows GitHub client and just plain old stuff like text editors. It's just that there's not a really easy plugin for SSMS just yet. There are third party things, and I'll talk about those now towards the end. What I'm going to do in order to demonstrate it is I'm going to go contribute a change live to a stored procedure called SP Blitz Lock out of our first responder kit. This is originally written by Eric Darling, and it's incredibly helpful for when you want to troubleshoot deadlocks in SQL Server 2012 or newer. But I happen to be working on a project with Azure SQL DB Hyperscale, which is the new version of Azure SQL DB, so to speak. And it lets you do really scale out in really cool, interesting ways. I'm testing it with a SQL or with an Azure SQL DB server. And when I go to run the current SP Blitz lock, I get an error. Reference to database and or server name MSDBO SysJobs is not supported in this version of SQL Server. Okay, that's fair. Azure SQL DB Hyperscale doesn't have sysjobs. 
So I've narrowed it down to this part of the stored procedure. This is the part of the stored procedure that you're going to go see me change. There's a link in here to enter an update statement that runs off of SysJobs, and I really need to wrap this in dynamic SQL and only execute it if it's not Azure SQL DB hyperscale. I want to only execute it on regular servers. So to go do the edit, I'm going to go over to firstresponderkit.org. This is where the scripts live. The firstresponderkit.org is just a short hyperlink that I put together that actually just redirects you over to GitHub. And we've got a, a branch or a store procedure. We've got a repository over at Breno's R Unlimited in GitHub. This is GitHub site in called the SQL Server First Responder Kit, where there's all kinds of queries, commits that other people have done, other people working on stuff. So before I go in there, I need to give you a quick glossary of terms. A GitHub account, you can kind of think of as either you or a company. In our case, the first responder kit is managed by a company, Breno's R Unlimited. A repository, you can kind of think of as a folder or a project. We've got one repository just with the first responder kit scripts. Those of you who've used Ola Hollingren's maintenance scripts, he has a repository too. There's lots of popular repositories out there where you can go look at the code and check in your own changes. Because several of us may be working at once, each repository has branches. And you can kind of think of this as a file save as, that you're saving a repository and keeping a different copy of it. So there's always a master branch. That's the main branch that's ready to go for production. You can think of this as the branch that's already been shipped. This is when you go to download someone's code. That's the safe, solid code that you get. But there's also a dev branch, which is ahead of master. This is where people are working and grabbing their changes from. Further than that, you have several branches underneath development. Say that we've got a team of five people who are all working on changes to SP Blitzlock. We can each have our own branches and even have multiple branches for each of us if we're working on different features at the same time. The more branches that you build, the harder your life is going to become. Just like imagine if you did your own source control back in the day, you did file save as all the place. You, you'd say things like SP report sales V1, SP report sales new, SP report sales corrected. And then you end up with this hot mess of code that you have to merge back together. GitHub does make some of that a lot easier. We'll show you how. Then whenever I get done making my changes, I'm going to commit my changes, which means that I'm going to push these things back up to the cloud. You can work locally and save your changes all the time, but eventually there's going to come a point where you want to push your changes up into the cloud to make sure that if something happens to your laptop or if you want other people to see what you're working on, then that's also really helpful. For example, just this morning, there was another contributor to the first responder kit where he pushed his changes up and I was able to say, oh, here, you've got a bug right here. Give him a review in his code and then he could go through and continue changing and keep working on it. Generally, you always want to work off of issues. Now, remember, with GitHub, it's all really about cooperation and collaboration, about working with other people. And you don't want to just go off and mash something together inside your own repository and then push it out there to have somebody else just take it. You generally want to start a discussion first and say, here's the thing I'm thinking about doing. Is there anything that I should be aware of as I go through and make these changes? Brian says, for what it's worth, we use both Visual Studio Team Services and Git via Visual Studio. Most of our databases are in SSDT projects. Yeah, it's really common to see that with developer tools, developer tools like Visual Studio and SQL Server database tools. They're SSDT. That's very common. It's very rare to see database front ends like SSMS or Azure Data Studio with built-in, very good integration with GitHub as opposed to it's just normal to see it over in uh, out in the development tools. So to see it, let's go pop open my virtual machine. So I have, let me go show my show you this desk. Do, 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 do. So I have over here showing, there you go. All right, cool. So I have over here SQL Server Management Studio, and I'm going to minimize that for a second and go back just to my desktop. I have an application for GitHub Desktop. 
Now this looks exactly the same, well, pretty close to the same, whether you're on Windows or whether you're on Mac. What this does is it lets me choose which of my repositories I'm working on. Right now, I only have the first responder kit set up on my individual workstation. The way that I got it set up on my workstation is that I went over to firstresponderkit.org, and then here's the repository. In order to get it started working inside your own desktop, you would download the GitHub desktop first and then click open in desktop. It'll let you go create your own local copy of a repository. There are huge drawbacks in opening someone else's repository. We'll talk about that in like 15 minutes. For now, I'm just going to focus on working in my own repository. So it's got a bunch of stuff around here, all kinds. You can build your own wiki, whatever. I'm going to focus on issues for a second. I need to create an issue about the problem that I'm having. You can see that other people are working on their own issues too. For example, Jeff this morning was working on letting SP Blitz cache and other code automatically return the version number that they're at without running the whole analysis. I've got to accept Jeff's pull request this morning too as well. So I'm going to click on SP Blitz lock here. This is the thing that I'm worried about not working. SP Blitz lock won't compile on Azure SQL DB. And I put in, here's what the current version of the script is, here's what my current behavior is, the error that I'm getting, and the thing that I've got to go fix. I've assigned myself, I've slapped some labels on there, which will be useful when people are searching for things later. And now I actually need to go commit that code. I need to go make a change to the code and go commit it up to the cloud. So the first thing that I need to do is that I need to go create a branch. I'm going to move things around just a little bit to make it easier to show. Over in GitHub Desktop, over on the left-hand side, right now I'm working in the development branch. You don't really want to work directly in development because that would be kind of like all of us trying to work in the same file at the same time. What I need to do is I need to go create a new branch. Now every project, every way people name things has a little bit different of a naming standard. I'm going to tell you mine, but feel free as you go through and look at other people's projects, you're going to see other things out there too as options. I'm going to do mine based on the issue number, which is up in the URL, and plus it's over here is number 1950. So I'm going to say 1950 SP Blitz Lock Azure SQL DB Hyperscale. I'm going to try to name it with something that's descriptive for me to remember and say new branch. Now, I have my own copy of these, these scripts, and I can go through and edit them. I can go through and open that. It's saved on my machine. Depending on how you set up your desktop, it'll be saved in different places. For example, me on my Windows VM, it's under Documents GitHub, and then I've got SQL Server First Responder Kit. And here's the list of scripts inside that project. I can now just go open them just like I would with any other text editor. I'm going to go ahead and open mine in SQL Server Management Studio. Let's go double click on SP Blitz Lock and get the party started. Wouldn't it be nice if when I double clicked on it, it actually worked though? Yeah, I forgot about that. SQL Server Management Studio 18, you're giving me a little bit of a problem there. Let's copy you over there. So SQL Server Management Studio 18, he didn't actually open the file, so I got to, yeah, I know, got to drag and drop that thing over there. So here we go. Uh, Marco says, technical problems, sound and video, none for me. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I shouldn't be so casual, right? But of course he can't hear me if he's having technical problems, so we can kind of make fun of him, right? That's not right. That's not right. So here's the stored procedure with where it is today. I'm going to do a little control F in here for sys jobs, and I'm going to find here's the part of the code that I need to fix. So I'm going to go make my changes to it, edit it, fix it up so that it works really well. I'll tell you a secret. I've, I've actually done that already. Like a TV chef, I've already got a saved copy of SP Blitz Lock that's fixed. So I'm going to copy paste all of the contents out. And I'm going to take the original SP Blitz lock and just paste right over the top of it. Save it and close it. Now, what did I change? Oh, man, this is the thing that just sucks about trying to manage T-SQL, right? Who knows what on earth got changed inside that big, ginormous uh, T-SQL stored proc? Well, GitHub, the GitHub desktop makes it really easy. 
So with the GitHub desktop here, this is their application that shows me what's going on inside the changes that I'm working on. Over here on the left hand side, it says you changed one file, you changed SP Blitzlock. Here are the changes that you made. You added a new variable, you added something for dynamic SQL here that I'm going to go execute. I can scroll down and I can see that I changed this stuff with the minus sign. This is the code that was removed. This stuff with the plus, this is the code that was afterwards. Martin says, I can't believe you didn't write code in the demo. What you would really laugh at is how long it took me to write this to begin with. <laughs> that, of course, it's like, you know, it's like the TV chef. All you have to do is switch things around. And all of a sudden it's done. If, wouldn't it be cool if we had the same thing with code? Like now all you have to do is write the entire application. Now let's just go check it in. How hard can it be? So it gives you this nice back and forth glance of exactly what you changed. And remember, this is only happening inside my desktop right now. I still haven't pushed it up to the cloud yet. So let's go save our work and push it up to the cloud. I need to commit my changes. So I'm going to say, and every project has their own guidelines about how you do this. I'm going to say number 1950 and notice how it's auto com auto completing. Whenever I'm typing in something like a pound sign and then a number, it knows that I'm referring to an issue. So now it's just linking straight up to that issue saying, oh yeah, SP Blitzlock won't compile. That's exactly the one. SP Blitzlock, Azure SQL DB hyperscale, say fixes number 1950. And GitHub's even really smart about if you say things like fixes or closes, um, it'll automatically link over to that issue. And when this stuff is committed into dev, when it, when the pull request is accepted and they accept my code and go, yep, you're good, it'll automatically even close the issue for me saying, yes, you're done. So let's go commit it. And then I need to publish my branch. Right now, my changes are only saved locally and I need to push this up to GitHub. I need to go shove this up in the cloud. And you see right up here, it says pushing to origin. So now my stuff is up in the cloud. Now the next thing is other people can go see it. If we go back over to the website, so here's my issue that I originally filed. If I refresh this page, and then I look again, Brent Ozar added a commit that referenced this issue 19 seconds ago. Here's the commit. So here's the thing that I did. And look at this. You even get a really nice website where it just shows you the diffs right built into the website. So I can see here's what it looked like before, just those specific lines of the code. Here's what it looks like after the things that I changed. If I want to see the raw file, I can do that too. Like if I want to get the whole entire T-SQL script, download it and test it. So I'll do that all the time. I'll say, all right, send this link to somebody and go, hey, can you look at this new version of SP Blitzlock and tell me if it fixes your problems? So let's say that I'm happy with it. Let's say that I'm really, and I'll be honest with you, I'm not actually, because check this out. I'm really anal retentive. I've tried to be anal retentive about putting semicolons in at the end of my lines. This totally wasn't on purpose, but I didn't put a semicolon at the end of my lines. There's all kinds of review tools that you get inside GitHub too. You can say things like, hey, dummy, terminate your statements with a semicolon. Pfft, Microsoft certified master whatever add a single comment so then people can do code reviews and they can reject your code stuff like that i know all about getting my code rejected uh, so what i can do is i can go back over to sql server management studio i can open that file again and i can slap another uh, semicolon on the end let's go back to recent files sp blitzlock and I happen to know kind of sort of where that declare is at. Uh, da -da 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 -da. There he is right there. So here's that declare right there. Let's make this bigger so that y'all can see it. Um, so here's the problem. I didn't put a term or a semicolon on there. I did it just now. So I can add that, save it. And you know, if I was really good, I would even test this on Azure SQL DB hyperscale. I should make it blatantly clear that I am in a yacht rock phase right now. So my Azure SQL DB hyperscale server is my list and your kiss is on my list. 
<laughs> but of course, this one I'm going to test in Maneater because Maneater is the one that I like doing my testing in and that at least the test completed successfully. I can even go look at SP Blitzlock, just make sure it works. And this is actually the desired effect. This is the error that I want to show to end users when it compiles successfully. All right, so we've made our change and now we need to push our change up back into the cloud again. I can close out of GitHub or close out of SSMS, minimize this fella go back over to the GitHub desktop, and whammo, GitHub desktop has already detected, hey, buddy, you've made another change to this file. And I can be like, yeah, yeah, that's that's true. I 1950 SP Blitz lock Azure SQL DB hyperscale. Oops, forgot my semicolon. Fixes number 1950. Commit, push it up to the cloud, and now it's up in the cloud. But it's still just my branch. It's still just the thing that I have and no one else has. I mean, other people can go look at it, but it's not up in the main kind of distribution of things. So in order to kind of merge things together, to merge my work with other people's, I can hit Control R, which brings me up a pull request. So now what I'm asking the person who owns the project to do is I'm saying, you know, your dev branch I want to take the changes from my code and move them up into the dev branch. As I describe that, it kind of sounds like I'm pushing my stuff up, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm really saying, hey, uh, Mr. Nice Man or Mrs. Nice Woman, can, can you take my changes? Can you pull my changes up into your project? Because you don't have the rights as a contributor to just jam your crappy T-SQL up into somebody's project. It really goes the other way around. You're asking them to pull your changes. So I'm asking them to pull my changes from my SP Blitzlock branch up to the dev branch. I'm going to say it fixes number 1950. Changes proposed. Skip the sysjobs query on Azure SQL DB hyperscale. And then if in a good world, I would put in how to test my code. But of course, you know how this rolls. What it's been tested on, it has only been tested on Azure SQL DB hyperscale. I, I'm going to undo what I just did there. So uh, what you'll find is a lot of projects have their own auto-completed text that goes into here so that when you do a pull request, they're helpfully kind of guide you into here are the things that you should do before you submit your request. Like, have you tested on these things to make sure that your code is good? It's okay if you haven't, we just want to know what you really have tried so that that way we may not try to duplicate your work. I have tested it on Azure DB Hyperscale, and here I'm going to assign myself to it. I can ask for other people to review my code, like if there's someone else on the web that I know has, you know, Kevin Farley, whoever, I can say, hey, come in, uh, review this for me. I can put it aside to a milestone. This is going to go ship in our February release. I can talk about whether or not it's a bug, Azure SQL DB, you name it, and then create this pull request. Now say, and of course, I happen to be the one who manages this project, but just say that someone else is about to review my pull request. Someone else who runs this project is going, what are you trying to do there? You see up at the top of the screen here, it says pull requests. I'm going to come into here. And these are all the pieces of code that people have contributed in the last couple few days where I've got to go through and review. So let's look at mine. When I look at it, it tells me how many files were changed. And then I can click on it and see what they were so that I can make sure that this is something that I'm okay with. And then I can go ahead and merge that pull request, meaning I can take this change, pull it into the public project and make it part of our normal production. This is what open source projects are doing all over the world. They're grabbing changes from people on demand and then merging them into the main branch. But you know what's really cool is that I just changed SP Blitzlock. Let's go back over to pull requests and let's see what else is going on. So Jeff over here has also added version checking for all of the stored procedures. If I go click on this, I can see that he changed 14 files too. Now his changes that he sent in were from before I did my work. I can click on the files that he changed 
and now I can see exactly what he changed. I'm going to do a control find on here for SP blitz lock. So I can see here are the changes that he made. And you know what's really amazing? Because he didn't change the lines that I changed, I can just accept his pull request without any problems. This is what's beautiful about distributed version control and doing stuff like GitHub, where it helps manage merges from different people who are working on the same files at the same time. This is so much better than the old Blockbuster school where we had to go and check changes out. I'm gonna, I would normally go and accept his changes right now, but I'll be honest, I, I haven't tested them yet this morning. So Jeff, I'm with you. I just haven't quite gotten there yet. So let's come back over to the slide deck. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Uh, Spencer says, oh, hold on a second here. It's still coming up. Uh, Spencer says, you are sharing your, let me move this out to a bigger window so I can see it. Uh, Spencer says, you are sharing your SQL files in File Explorer. How do we commit the files while working in SSMS? You joined late didn't you more Spencer you can watch the recording and we'll talk about that uh, so let's come back over to the slide deck go past the screenshots um, go past a couple of other things here uh, it, it this does seem like a lot of work right normally when we're dealing with what old school DBAs would call source control was we would just save files in a folder and then everyone else would open that same folder like on a file server but it's so cool when you start getting into the tools that GitHub gives you with an online deal. So for example, if I say, I want to know who hosed up SP Blitz. I have a line that I'm having problems with. Who changed this line and why did they change it? I can click on the blame button or the history button. The history button shows me all the check-ins. The blame button, it's really cool. When I click the blame button, it opens up the entire script and it shows you on a line by line basis who changed that line and when and why. Because you have to file an issue for every time you change one of these scripts, I can scroll down here when I'm having a problem and go, all right, there's this deal here with this one query that's trying to return and check and see if things are Linux. Who did this? Okay, it was Randolph West. Now I know that I can go talk to him about the changes that he made in this code and why he made them. Totally worth it. Now, everything that I've done so far has been working in my own repo, but say that you want to work in someone else's repo. One of the most popular repos, repositories, one of the most popular repositories in the SQL Server community is DBA Tools. This is a PowerShell framework with commandlets that people all over the world have written in order to make production database administration easier. So if you go, even if you just search for DBA Tools or it's dbatools.io, you get their whole GitHub repository here. And one of the most important things I can tell you about working in someone else's repository is scroll down and read. Read what's on the home page. Because a lot of these maintainers, they put all kinds of work into building documentation for you uh, so that you can understand how to help contribute. They want to make it as easy as possible for you to contribute your own code. DBA Tools is a great example of that. Down as I scroll down in their GitHub project, they have their README file, and it says there's over 1,500 of us in the SQL Server community Slack in the DBA Tools channel. Go click on here to get an invited, and then you can go through and start uh, contributing your code. When you go to contribute your code, you're going to be making a fork of their repository. You're basically going to be taking their entire repository and saving it into your own GitHub account. When I say that, that has some bad implications. When someone says they're going to fork something, you might have heard bad things about that in the open source community because there have been kind of wonky forks in the past. For example, MySQL was originally started in 1995, and then 2008, Sun bought MySQL. There were people who were frustrated and were like, oh my God, we don't want to have a separate you know, database managed by Sun. We want our own database. So they forked MySQL off into their own accounts and then started working on it over there. 
you're welcome to do that. This is what open source is all about. Depending on the licensing with, for example, both the DBA Tools Project and the First Responder Kit Project, encourage you to go through and make whatever changes you want and reuse this stuff in commercial work if you want to. In 2010, Oracle bought Sun, so Oracle kind of acquired MySQL in a roundabout way. And of course, people always have their knee-jerk reactions about, Oracle, I don't want them to have anything to do with it. I'm going to go use this other database platform. But the beauty of open source is that you can do that. You can go take that other database platform and run with it and just run off uh, making your own changes. Anybody can fork a repository at any time. The thing to know is before you go and fork a repository, make sure you read the license of the tools that you're working with. Because there are some repositories out there that are open source, but there are limitations on what you can do with them. Azure, or, uh, Azure Data Studio is a great example of that. You can fork the source code, you can make changes to the source code, but you have to read the license to understand how the binaries are affected and your ability to redistribute those binaries. Now back to my simple example with DBA Tools. The SQL Collaborative owns the DBA Tools repository. So what I would have to do is I have to fork their repository into my own account, make the changes that I want to make inside my own account, and then send a pull request to them saying, hey, can you take my changes into your account? What will usually happen with this is there's some negotiation that happens there. They want to make sure that your code is tested properly. They'll have volunteers talk to you about, hey, what changes you might consider making. And I know this seems like a ton of work, that this seems like a spectacular amount of work compared to uh, what you might just do inside your own company with just saving files back and forth. The reality is, is that GitHub wasn't designed for projects like your personal scripts folder. I still recommend that you use GitHub for stuff like your personal scripts folder. And in the recap, I'm going to talk about why. GitHub is really designed for things like Books Online. This is the Books Online project, and I checked it out. I say I checked it out. I created a fork. Can you, man, it's the year 2019, and I just use the term checked it out. I never use the term checked it out. It's because I used it, well, I mean, I use it for things like I checked out that car or whatever, but, you know, that's our library book. I don't check out library books. I go to Wikipedia. I get bored just surfing through Wikipedia. I could do that for the rest of my life. It always blows me away that people go, I can't ever imagine retiring. Are you kidding? Have you seen Wikipedia? Have you seen how many pages it has? It's amazing. There's so much good stuff inside there. But so GitHub was designed for stuff like Books Online, Microsoft's Books Online for SQL Server. This, there have been 9,000 through 437 changes to Books Online just since the last time I updated my own local repository. It's really good for vibrantly active projects like this, like DBA Tools, like to some extent the first responder kit. So through the course of using uh, open source and GitHub, there have been a few things that I've learned the hard way. Source controlling binary files sucks. Excel is a binary file. Power BI desktop files are a binary file. It's just kind of like one big zip file with a whole bunch of binaries in it. And when you go to check stuff like that into GitHub, GitHub's like, I'm sorry, I can't tell what's going on inside there. I have no idea what parts changed. Conflict resolution is still terrible. If two people change the same lines in the same file, there's no automatic fix for that. Some human being has to get involved and parse out the differences. This is one of the reasons why you check in your changes as frequently as you can in small manageable chunks so that you don't end up with a huge bunch of conflicts with someone else. This is also why you don't go make arbitrary changes. I bet a lot of y'all have your own personal uh, formatting styles. You have your own way of formatting code that you like to see. Don't go formatting someone else's open source project because when you go check in the changes, it'll look like you changed every single line and they'll just hit the big old note button and tell you to start over. Source controlling for databases is still really hard. Like if someone goes in and changes a table or someone adds a few indexes, there's nothing built into SQL Server that makes it really easy to catch these kinds of configuration level changes. I know what I'd really like is I'd just like to have something go point and look at my SQL Server and every time someone changes something, automatically check that into source control so that I could see a history of everything that got changed and who changed it along the way and when. 
That's not how source control works. Source control isn't designed as an after the fact kind of thing, although Redgate has SQL source control that can watch your server and check in changes. That's just not a great way to use it. What you really want to do is use it before you make the changes out to production. There's a couple of tools that you can use in order to make this easier. Redgate SQL Source Control, and then to some extent, Azure Data Studio. Azure Data Studio is designed to be the replacement for SQL Server Management Studio for people who write code. If you write a lot of T-SQL, you write a lot of stored procedures, functions, views, they're trying to give you a really good query writing experience inside there. And because of that, it's easier to get GitHub integration built working into that than it is into SQL Server Management Studio. This is generally too true for any kind of developer tooling that you use. On the Mac, I tend to do my SQL Server work in a text editor, a text editor that has integrations with GitHub so that I can see right then and there. For example, I have SP Blitz open here. I can see what repository I'm in, and I can see what uh, branch that I'm in inside of GitHub. If you're going to do uh, GitHub, you want to learn Markdown. And I would give this as advice just to anyone who's working in tech today. Get, uh, Markdown is a syntax language that lets you do what you see is what you get formatting inside of a text editor. I almost think of it as like better than Microsoft Word because I can just type out the formatting that I want as I go. All the documentation projects out there in the world these days use Markdown as their formatting. And these two sites will make it really easy for you to get started. Maz over in the Slack room says, I love Markdown. I am right there with you. I take every one of my notes this way now. I use a Markdown editor on my iPhone, on my iPad, all of those. Just produces gorgeous, easy results. Uh, be friendly when you're working in open source communities. Remember that the people on the other side of the screen, they're usually volunteers. Think DBA Tools Project is a classic example. These people are heroes working in their own time, giving back to you, giving you code that you can use in order to make your job better. Don't go in there like they owe you something. Your code sucks. I don't like the way you wrote your indents. You should use tabs, not spaces. This will fail every which way but loose. Be polite, upbeat, friendly, and by all means say thank you. When someone helps you out in the open source community, be thankful, say please, thank you, and appreciate the work that they've done. If nothing else, just hop into those Slack rooms where they're do talking about their work and thank them for the work that they've given you. Uh, so for filing a bug issue or feature request, in Slack, James uh, dumps a bunch of PowerShell in there. Uh, James, check out, there's a plus sign right next to where you type. If you put a click on the plus sign right next to where you type, Slack will format your code for you, and it'll keep it in a nice, compact thing so that it doesn't explode and take over the whole channel. It's pretty cool. Uh, so for filing a bug or issue request, no, don't apologize. You did good. Man, dude, we're all learning this the hard way. That's why we're here. Uh, Billius uh, copy-pasted your stuff in there. So when you file a bug, if you think something's broken in there, or if you want something changed, remember that the people on the other side of the screen are not free contractors. Even when you go into Microsoft's open source repos, yes, the people on the other side of the screen, they are working on corporate software and getting paid for it, but that doesn't mean that they're your free contractors. If you have a support problem, go call the support line, 1-800-MICROSOFT, you pay 500 bucks, they work with you until the problem's fixed. Same thing with open source. You can't elbow your way into you know, somebody's Slack room and go, hey man, I think I found a bug or I want a change request, go and then leave or just post some cryptic error message. You wanna make sure to talk with other people about the change that you wanna make and remember that you should be expected to contribute the code yourself. If there's something that you want bad enough to ask for it, you should be prepared to go and do that work. In terms of branching, read the guidelines that each project has for how they want their branching done, which branch they want to start with, like is it master or dev, so that you know uh, how they expect to have their code, and you'll get a much faster response from them. Don't learn from Microsoft's repos. I love Microsoft, and they're doing an amazing job at the whole GitHub thing. 
But because they have so much money, they're able to build in all kinds of really cool automated tools inside their own repositories. For example, when you check something into Azure Data Studios repos or into Books Online repos, there's this complex uh, dance of workflow where you get automated notes saying, hey, you need to go uh, respond to this licensing request. You need to go agree to this uh, contract. And you'll see them handle things a very certain way. That works really well for them. They're a big, huge for-profit company. That's not how any other repos work out in the world. So to bring it home in terms of a recap and your next steps in your career and why GitHub matters so much, there's a glossary of important terms there on the screen. This slide deck will be up in the uh, more resources link too as well. The more resources link, which will be published about a ha an hour after the, this webcast finish at brenozar.com slash go slash GitHub for DBAs, where I'll have all of these links. I love the official resources because GitHub is so mature. They've built out, you know, it's been around for so long. It's not like it's mature. It's not like an old guy. Um, it's because it's been around for so long. There's lots of really good documentation as to how you go and get started and videos, lots of really good videos walking you through setting up your first repo, dealing with a merge conflict, etc. I've got a few popular repos there that you can go poke around and see how they work in terms of uh, how they accept contributions, their Slack communities, all that. And then people who like this tend to like hacker news. If you go to news.ycombinator.com, they have all kinds of interesting stories about people who do open source work, things like that. The reason why I think this is really important for your career is that skills continue to morph over time. The things that you did to get paid five years ago they may not get you paid five years from now. There's that great saying in career development, what got you here won't get you there, like won't take you to the next step. And the skills with stuff like Visual Source Save, of course, those are just dead and gone. But GitHub, not only is it bringing you new skills, it's your new personal resume and it's verifiable. Someone who wants to hire you can go look at your GitHub profile and see, oh yeah, that person is actually active in a few repositories. And as I zoom in down to this section down at the bottom, that person has done 745 contributions in the last year. Here's a little graph of the days when they've done code commits. I Look, I know you have a family life. You have loved ones. You have people you need to take care of. You have a dog and a cat that you cherish deeply. Well, maybe you don't cherish the cat that much. Uh, you have a life outside of work, but giving you this, the ability to say, here are the things that I've actually done over time. It's a lot like having a blog that you can point to and go, here's the activity that I've done with the community over the years. So, so I can kind of prove that I've been making progress. This kind of thing is an awesome edge that other people in the job market simply don't have. So before I take questions, I will switch over to uh, mentioning this week's sponsor. So this week's sponsor was Quest Spotlight Cloud. It is a totally free monitoring solution for up to five SQL servers. You don't have to put in a database. You don't have to build any kind of repository. You just install the agent, starts pushing your monitoring data up into the cloud, and they automatically tell you 24-7 when you have things like failed backups, extremely high CPU, all kinds of stuff works in a web browser, and they have apps for iOS and Android as well. So it really is free to get started and easy to use. So you can visit that over at brentozar.com slash go slash spotlight. And now let's go take a look at what your questions are. 